question, Sir John. What is the difference between integration and reintegration? Answer. Integration is the correct term to use when it is the first time of an individual to become uh, a beneficiary of the integration program of the GPH. Reintegration means the person was previously integrated, then he subsequently resigned, and now you want him to be reintegrated the second time around. Question. Sir John, what were the difficulties experienced by the MNLF in the peace process? Explain the important events that happened. Answer. The MNLF experienced five major setbacks in the peace process, and three of which are results of factionalism within the MNLF organization. Negotiating under the banner of peace is difficult when the unity and discipline of the members back there in the grounds is uncontrollable. The general rule is, when there is peace talks at the front, there must be a temporary stop of hostilities and security threats in the grounds. When there is factionalism, um, it means that... Uh, there are people in your organization in the grounds that you cannot control and as a result the negotiator loses his face and credibility first was the factionalism uh, in 1976 when Hashim Salamat uh, the top organizer of the MNLF during that time did not agree to Nur Miswari's decision to accept the GPH offer of ceasefire and peace talks. While Nur Miswari was attending a negotiation in Tripoli, back in the homeland Mindanao, we had Hashim Salamat forming a new organization called the New MNLF, which he later renamed to MILF. It was painful for MNLF because um, MNLFs who were recruited by Hashim Salamat said that uh, the more advanced weapons of the MILF came from the GPH. So clearly, it was GPH who formed MILF as a separatist of the MNLF to use it as a factor that will weaken the credibility of Nur Miswari who was then negotiating an agreement in Libya. Second is the factionalism in 1991 when a very promising young MNLF leader from Basilan named uh, Gaddafi Janjalani was swayed away by the MNLF uh, SAC Chief of Staff um, Melham Alam. Together, Janjalani and Alam formed the Abu Sayyaf group. The painful part is that the MNLFs who were recruited but refused to join the ASG reported that they personally saw the advanced weapons of the ASG being taken out directly from boxes with AFP and DND markings. So clearly, the GPH had an invisible hand in forming the Abu Sayyaf group or uh, for whatever reason they have, which we don't know. Third was the factionalism in 2001 when the 15 members of the high-level executive committee of the MNLF or we call them uh, 15 EC or EC15 conspired to execute a, uh, an organizational takeover of the leadership of the MNLF. The painful part was that the GPH played along with the 15 EC framed up the genuine MNLF uh, leader Nur Miswari and jailed him as a political prisoner until released by the court after 8 years. Fourth is the fallout of the MNLFs whose expectations on the implementation of the agreements are not met. When they fall out of the MNLF, they join uh, other armed groups that are notorious. The GPH 
will never run out of excuses for not performing their obligations in the agreement. The idea of terminating our participation in the peace talks for this reason has crossed our minds many times. We don't know, you know, one moment uh, we might just stop and walk away from the peace process for good because we've been fooled with false promises many times already. If not because of Nur Miswari's firm belief in the peace process, we have already abandoned the peace process. Fifth is the absence of funds to sustain the subsistence of uh, and troubles of MNLF leaders whose primary function is to attend uh, uh, vital peace process activities which include uh, one attending uh, attending uh, negotiations two uh, advocating peace in their respective commands in the organization and three keeping their members away from the influence of lawless elements one of the major setbacks of the peace process is when MNLF leaders who play key roles in the activities are not financially sustained. In fact, our experience shows that uh, lack of personal funds is one of the major reasons why many of our MNLF leaders fell out of the peace process. And it is even more painful to accept the fact that some of our leaders left the MNLF to join the other lawless groups. Question, Sir John, what is the peace process? Um, I mean, is the peace process important in settling the conflict between the MNLF and GPH? If yes, did the peace process uh, pave the way for the rebels to integrate? Answer. The conflict of interest between MNLF and GPH can never meet at the end of the road. The conflict of interest cannot be settled in the middle ground. Only one will prevail in the end. The peace process is just temporary. The negotiation will only provide a peaceful path towards whatever final resolution will come out in the future. The MNLF's political solution to the poverty in Mindanao is an independent Mindanao nation. The Bangsamoro people are, con are unconquered. Our forefathers have been struggling for sovereignty in the homeland and our slogan towards this vision is victory or the graveyard. No one can put down the red flag that bears the spirit of a struggle for independence of the Bangsamoro land. On the other hand, the GPH wants to hold on to Mindanao as part of the sovereign territory of the Philippines. The GPH considers Mindanao as a land far flung south that is rich of exploitable natural resources and endless supply of impoverished population who can provide domestic health services for the residents of Imperial Manila. Mindanao is at the bottom of the food chain in the Philippines and is vital in survival of the Philippines. During Ramos time, the peace process produced um, the 1996 Final Peace Agreement or FPA which uses integration as a strategy to take a chance of possibly putting an end to the conflict. The integration strategy believes that if the GPH will incorporate the MNLF combatants in the regular armed forces of the Philippines, the MNLF will run out of members and will eventually cease to exist. Surprisingly, the opposite happened. On one side of the equation, the integration strategy reduced the number of MNLF members by less than 10,000 as expected. But on the other side of the equation, the number of MNLF members unexpectedly increased in exponential proportion. Partly because some people who have no combat experience began joining the MNLF to use it as a stepping stone 
to gain an advantage in the competitive method of selection and recruitment in the armed forces of the Philippines. Before the 1996 FPA, the MNLF had around uh, 100,000 members. Fifteen years after the implementation of the 1996 FPA, we have now around six, uh, 700 to 800 enlisted members and a big chunk of it are waiting for more integration program by the AFP and the uh, PNP. The increase of NLF members is not bad at all. The MNLFs have gained the respect in the past as an effective anti-government fighter. But after the FPA, the MNLF has already transformed into a peaceful catalyst of governmental reforms. But please don't get me wrong. I will always have to remind you that MNLF never gave up the struggle for an independent nation of Mindanao. The increase of NLF, MNLF members is a good thing for Mindanao, peace, because if these people did not join the MNLF, who knows, they could have already joined other armed groups that are notorious. When a person joins the MNLF, you know, it is like switching on the peacefulness of that uh, gun owner and his uh, peacefulness switches off when he joins the other groups. The prospect of increasing MNLF members is very strong. There are over 2 million impoverished families in Mindanao who blames the Philippine government for their misery. The more they become knowledgeable of the vision and economic solutions of the MNLF, the more they love the MNLF.